Welcome to another episode of Investing Compass. Before we begin, a quick note that the information contained in this podcast is general in nature, does not take into account your personal situation, circumstances, or needs. So, Shani, we had our weekly one-on-one yesterday. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't in the office. You were not in the office, and you have moved home with your parents. Yes. Yeah. So, Shani's out there for eight weeks total, Mm -hmm. and you wanted to take a walk during our call. So Mm -hmm. you were out walking Priscilla. Yeah. And I, of course, can hear if somebody's talking to you. Yes. And so this- And there are a lot of people talking. People are very friendly. Yes. And Shani's not used to this (laughs) because she's not like speaking to people. And so she's walking around. This woman comes up and starts talking about Shani's dog. And I will mention that I had headphones in. So, and I was obviously on the phone on a meeting. No, I, I was aware. Yes. Um, apparently this one was not. <laughs> and so she talks about your dog, which whatever is natural. People come up and ask questions. Mm-hmm. And then I'm listening to this woman saying, we should set up a play date for our dogs. Yes. And she asked you like five times for your phone number and you refused to give it to her. <laughs> it was very awkward because, you know, sometimes you just know when people don't want to do it. And you're, you back off. But she didn't back off. She did not back off. And eventually you kept saying, I'm on the phone. And she was like, show me your phone number. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, I'm on the phone. She was like, call my phone now. I'm like, I'm literally on a phone call right now. Anyway, so she really wanted Priscilla to meet her dog, who was also a Pomeranian, was two years old, dissexed. She promised that it had all the vaxes, but it had never- Yeah, Shani asked this yeah. woman if the dog was vaccinated. <laughs> Because she was like, it's not just sex, and it's never met another dog before. And I was like, well, why? Anyway, this is going on a tangent. But basically, what she said is that it's a very timid dog who's never met a dog before. And she wanted Priscilla to meet this dog. And I couldn't run away fast enough. <laughs> I know. This could have been your only friend in the suburbs. Exactly. But anyway, the reason obviously you're out there is because you bought a house. And that's what we're going to talk about today, housing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So housing is an incredibly popular investment or purchase for Australians. And obviously, this is not news to anyone listening to this, but you know, since I've been Australia, I've certainly seen firsthand that the Australian love of investing in property is certainly more than I ever saw in the US. So direct property makes up 15% of self-managed super fund asset allocation. And a study by Money Magazine found that Australians thought investing in real estate was more secure than the share market, gold, cash, and fixed interest. And there is a reason that Australians are so into property. Over the past 25 years, median house prices have increased by 412% and median unit prices have gone up by 316%. That compares to a return from the ASX All Laws Index and that has risen by 261%. And the size of capital required means that it is an ultra-long commitment and almost always includes leverage. And so a question that a lot of investors have is whether they should pay down their mortgage or they should invest. And we'll spoil the ending a little bit here, but it's worth mentioning that, of course, this is a case of opportunity cost that is based on calculations, but it's also based on what people want to achieve. So what we'll do in this episode is look at the two strategies for mortgages, and then the considerations that investors should have when making a decision to employ one of these strategies. We'll also mention a couple of caveats about investment properties in this episode, but we're really focused on your principal place of residence, the PPR. And we want to frame this discussion around a PPR not being an investment. It is your home, and therefore we're not comparing or including property appreciation as a consideration in this episode. The episode will focus on the decision-making process between reducing your mortgage and putting your money into other assets such as equities. So let's start with the two strategies first for mortgages and investing. All right. So they're concurrent or sequential. So concurrent is when you have a mortgage but you also start putting money into other types of assets like equities. Sequential is focusing your energy on paying down your mortgage. And only then, only after you've paid it off, do you focus on investing in other assets. There are obviously a lot of other variables that are involved in the decision to take either of these avenues. The first is assuming that you do have extra cash after your expenses and mortgage payments. And you need to ensure that you're able to afford your mortgage payments in your budget. 
but you also need to ensure that you have built a buffer to be ahead of your mortgage repayments before you consider investing. You never know what the future holds, wages are never certainty, and you may need to take time off of work for unexpected circumstances, or you might have unexpected expenses like a car or house repair. And we'll speak a little more about this further along in the episode, but the point is that you should ensure that you have enough to cover this. And going to that point of unexpected circumstances, one factor you should consider is how you actually earn your money. If you're in a cyclical industry, a contractor, or just anyone whose income is uncertain, usually people prefer to build up a little bit of cash because of the uncertainty of their sustainable surplus in their budget and the higher chance that they'll have to come to a situation where there might be a missed mortgage payment. And this, however, does not mean that you should not invest if you don't have an ironclad contract and guaranteed work. We'll walk through these buffers you can build up to help prevent unfavorable situations when you're not able to meet your commitments. What we will say, though, is that investing becomes more attractive when your work is stable. The last thing you want to do is hit a period of low or no income that forces you to sell down your portfolio at an unfavorable time to meet mortgage repayments. But again, those situations are preventable with the right preparation. Then, deciding what to do with this extra cash is dependent on a few main considerations. The first is returns. What returns are you expecting from the asset you're trying to invest in? Does it earn more on your funds than the mortgage rates? Owner-occupier rates are sitting at around 5 to 6% for most mortgages, and equity markets have a different risk-return profile. You're taking on risk, but for a higher reward. And some general guidance from Christine Benz, Director of Personal Finance at Morningstar. She mentions that investors need to be aware about whether a need will arise to access their money. So Christine Benz is based out of the US, and they don't have offset accounts there. But this is a consideration for investors that do not have an offset account. You need to bear in mind your need for liquidity because you're not able to sell the kitchen sink in a pinch if you need the funds. And she also mentions tax breaks, but we'd like to add that tax costs and breaks are both considerations. Depending on the type of loan you've taken out, it'll impact your tax outcomes and deduction eligibility. If the property in question is an investment property, your interest may be tax deductible. This isn't applicable if it's your primary residence. In the same way, tax should also be a consideration if you're looking to invest in equities. All of the rates of returns that we use in this podcast that are used by fund managers or when you look at investment returns are pre-tax. We have marginal tax rates in Australia, so the after-tax returns from investments will vary based on how much you earn, but also the level of franking credits and capital gains you earn. So tax consequences are definitely a consideration when you're looking to invest and you have an outstanding mortgage. I think it's important to consider that most of us have to balance this choice of paying down a mortgage and investing, meaning that the crux of this this argument is that we need to consider the opportunity cost of our decisions. What is better for us and what is going to put us in a better position? And so when we think about this opportunity cost, it's important to look forward. So far, we've looked at historical returns, but is that the same opportunity set that investors are choosing from? And the short answer is no. Both equities and housing markets have changed and will continue to evolve as we move forward. We won't focus on the cases for both of these asset classes in this episode because they're separate episodes themselves. Our interview with Matt Waitcher looked at future expected returns for asset classes, and we did an episode on the sustainability of the growth of the housing market and more relevant interest rates. We'll link these episodes on our resources page. And Christine suggests to look at the returns on guaranteed securities and whether that eclipses the mortgage rate. So guaranteed security would include savings accounts, term deposits, annuities, anything that's going to give you a guaranteed return. But again, the next consideration is that these guaranteed returns only matter if you need guarantees. If you're an investor who is closing in on retirement, you have more reason to value the sure things, either reducing your overhead in retirement by reducing your mortgage or building up your cash reserves. When we look at the current market of guaranteed securities, you'd be hard-pressed to find a guaranteed return that matches the current owner-occupier or investment loan rates of around 5 to 6%. But it is worth diving into this a bit because I think most discussions of paying down your mortgage gloss over what it actually means to pay off your mortgage. All right, so let's start with the basics. When you take out a mortgage, part of your monthly mortgage payment goes to interest and part to principal. So a mortgage has something called an amortization schedule. And that amortization schedule shows how much of each payment goes to principal and interest. And the loan amortizes over time. 
And amortization is just a fancy word that means gradually paying off the principal. And in a mortgage amortization schedule, you start off paying mostly interest, and then gradually over the life of the loan, the percent of your payment that goes to principal increases. Now, if you make extra payments that are higher than the mortgage, in other words, you're paying it down, that whole payment will go to principal. So in fact, you're skipping forward on your amortization schedule, which means that more of your future regular mortgage payments will go to principal and less to interest. So you're effectively saving on interest going forward because the principal is less. And that means that the return you are getting for those extra payments is equal to the interest rate on your mortgage. What you are effectively doing is shortening your mortgage term. So if you have a 30-year mortgage, it is really getting shorter and shorter with each extra payment. But the shortening of your term won't actually impact the amount you owe monthly. From a cash flow perspective, nothing changes, even as each extra regular payment would increase your net worth, more as, of course, you would own more of your home as the bank owns less. But what you really want is to pay off your whole mortgage because then you have all of this extra cash flow. But more on that in a bit. If you have a very long time horizon, you've got a mortgage that's on a decent interest rate and you've already, you're already saving for retirement in super, you have less reason to prioritize mortgage pay down. Although the returns that you may earn on your equity portfolio may not be that impressive over the next decade or so, they'll likely beat mortgage interest rates over a longer time horizon. And time horizon is the major factor that will determine whether you employ a concurrent or a sequential strategy. As a general rule, it's said that if you have less than three years on your mortgage, it's worth focusing your efforts on paying down your mortgage. And the reason for this is what I discussed above. Even though at the end of your mortgage, you are paying mostly principal with each regular mortgage payment, once you make the finish line or once the finish line is in sight, then you get the reward. Because if you're paying $3,000 a month for your mortgage payment, the minute you make your last mortgage payment, all of a sudden you have $3,000 extra a month in your budget to spend on whatever you want. And so in this case, who cares what the interest rate is? Get to that finish line as fast as possible because the reward is huge. And this is where we need to come up with another consideration on paying your mortgage. What is your intention for your home? The average Australian owns a home for 11 years, according to CoreLogic. And this has actually lengthened over time, which is a good thing. But if you own a home for 11 years, you aren't getting that far on the amortization schedule of a 30-year mortgage. You're still paying a lot of interest with each mortgage payment you make. And if you don't intend to own your home forever and have no intention of paying it off, the shortening of your mortgage has less of a value for you because making all those extra payments will never get you to the holy grail, which is owning your home outright and wiping that monthly payment out of your budget. Morningstar Investor is built for investors by investors. It provides independent research and data on over 40,000 securities, tools to build and maintain an investment portfolio, and investor education resources to support you, regardless of where you are in your investing journey. Explore opportunities with our monthly global best ideas. Explore our ETF model portfolios. Plan better with two years of dividend forecasts for ASX listed stocks. Stay informed with independent thought leadership. We've built tools to help you construct, monitor, and maintain your portfolio, including our portfolio manager. Integrated with one of Australia's leading portfolio tracking tools, ShareSight, Morningstar has been empowering investor success for over 35 years. We're passionate about your outcomes and are here every step of the way as you achieve them. Take out a free four-week trial to access our resources. Find the details in the episode notes. And here is a really interesting thing mathematically. Never thought I'd say that. What you are doing by making extra payments is you are effectively reducing the leverage on your home. And there is an argument to be made that this is a bad thing if you expect your home to keep increasing in value because the leverage will juice your returns as long as they are positive. If housing prices fall, that is a whole different ballgame. Now, this is a bit of a tricky concept. So let's walk through an example. Say you buy a home for $1 million and you put down 20% or 200000 You own this home for 11 years. In the first scenario, you just make the regular mortgage payments on a 5% loan, and we're assuming that that interest rate doesn't change. So let's say the value of your home increases 7% a year. That means in 11 years when you sell it, it's now worth $2.1 million. Now, there are lots of ways to think about the return you earn on a house. 
you've paid a lot of interest to the bank over those 11 years. So technically, if we were to calculate a return, we'd have to take that interest into account. But you also get another benefit out of it. You've got a place to live. If you didn't have that home, you would be paying rent. So for the purpose of this example, we're going to say the payments you've made to the bank are just the cost of having somewhere to live. And we're going to calculate the return you earn off the $200,000 that you put down. So after 11 years, the $800,000 loan that you took out at a 5% rate is now roughly a $648,000 loan. That is what you still owe the bank. So you sell the house for $2.1 million, you pay the bank back $648,000, and that leaves you with $1.452 million. And of course, you put down $200,000. So the return you earned, the annual return you earned over those 11 years is 19.75%. Now, you might be sitting there trying to figure out how you earn that return when housing prices only went up 7% a year. The reason is leverage. You took out a loan. Leverage is a multiplier on returns, as long as they are positive. If housing prices go down, the same leverage will turn the situation into a disaster. So let's run a separate scenario. This is a scenario where you are aggressively paying down your mortgage on the house, although you don't intend to ever pay it off. So let's say you're putting $1,000 extra a month or $12,000 a year into paying down your mortgage. Now, when you sell your house after 11 years, the loan you have to pay back to the bank is only $497,000. And you get to keep $1.6 million in proceeds on the sale. So happy days, but not so quick. Because instead of $200,000, you have now paid $332,000 for your house because you had 11 years of paying down your mortgage by $12,000 a year. So now the return that you earned on that house is 15.37% a year. So it's actually less. Now, as we said, we've made some assumptions here. Technically, you would apply the interest costs and time weight those extra principal payments. That doesn't really matter in the big scheme of things. The fact of the matter is that you took $332,000 of your money and you put it into a home through the down payment and extra mortgage payments. That is money you could have invested or done anything with. Your regular mortgage payments were just the cost of not being homeless. Under that scenario, with paying down the principal in a home you never expected to pay off, you have lowered your return and you have lowered it by reducing the leverage on an appreciated asset. So there are certainly positives to paying down your home. You are building more of an equity buffer in case housing prices drop. But if you think that housing prices are going to go up, that leverage will increase your returns. One last thing to think about. If you're able to save more than a 20% deposit on your home and put down 30% or more, you're also reducing your leverage. But the value in doing this is that you're also reducing your monthly mortgage payment and increasing your cash flow. But the second you buy your home, you remove your ability to do that even if you're making extra repayments. They won't affect your monthly mortgage repayment. So let's go back to the investing side of things. If you do have a long time left on your mortgage and or aren't intending to ever pay it off, the more attractive investing becomes as an alternate to paying down your house. Longer time horizons for equity investments have meant that they have time to compound. Compounding is a theme that we discuss a lot, but it's the key to how people build wealth and become successful investors. The longer you have to keep your money in the market, the higher your return, meaning you have a greater chance of earning more than the mortgage interest rate. Let's look at a quick example of how time horizon can impact the growth of wealth. We can use the example of the savings needed to accumulate a million dollars by age 65. When you're 25, you have 40 years till you reach 65. You only need to save $405 a month to get to a million dollars. $805,789 of this, $1 million, comes from investment growth and compounding. When you have 10 years left, you need to contribute $5,846 a month to get to a million dollars. 298,458 of that comes from investment growth and compounding. This is where we come to opportunity costs again. The opportunity cost of your surplus is not considering the return that you get from your investment, but the compounding of those reinvested returns. This is what Warren Buffett was talking about when he spoke about his $300,000 haircut. If a dollar today was going to be worth $20 in the future, then in his mind, the two were an equivalent. His friends and family often heard him equate things like haircuts to large amounts. When he spoke about purchasing his home in Omaha for $31,500, he expressed incredible regret 
and called it Buffett's folly because in his mind, he thought that he had foregone the growth of that 31500 to a much larger sum after compounding. Now, this is not to say we should take Buffett's perspective on housing and just forego investing in houses or paying the mortgage, but it's illustrative of the decision of the opportunity costs that we must all grapple with. And when you have a longer time horizon, the opportunity cost of foregoing investing is larger. I think it's also important to note how paying down your mortgage impacts diversification of your portfolio. Paying down your mortgage is pure principle, meaning that you're putting more and more money into housing as an asset class. If you look at your net worth holistically, you need to decide if all your taxable wealth should be tied up in a house. And obviously, your view of this would change depending on the housing market. But remember that there can be differences between the overall housing market and the suburb or state that your house is in. The local economy can have an impact on housing prices in your area, and preferences for where people want to live may impact the desirability and price of your particular home. Housing is generally the biggest single investment that people make. Just remember that you're adding more of your assets to this investment by paying down your mortgage. This is another case for the concurrent approach, ensuring that you're not tying your wealth to one asset. So these are all considerations for when you decide whether to take a concurrent or sequential approach to mortgages and investing. Ultimately, time horizon is really important to deciding this. We take a long-term look, and we are long-term investors at Morningstar. The longer you have in the market, the better the chances are that you will reach your financial goals. For many people, owning their house is not their only financial goal. People can have goals attached to travel, a comfortable retirement, education-related goals. Investing for a number of goals at the same time makes sense in most situations. For those closer to retirement, reducing their mortgage down may make the most sense in lieu of guaranteed returns that exceed their mortgage interest payments. All right, Shani, we made it. You are anxious to move into the home you've purchased so that people (laughs) don't talk to you when you're out walking Priscilla. But... Thank you very much for listening. Any comments about Shawnee's etiquette in ignoring this woman (laughs) or the podcast, (laughs) we would appreciate. And if if she's listening. I'm really sorry. (laughs) There you go. Thank you very much. Any advice in this podcast is general advice or regulated financial advice under New Zealand law prepared by Morningstar Australasia Proprietary Limited and or Morningstar Research Limited without reference to your financial objectives, situations or needs. You should consider the advice in light of these matters and any relevant product disclosure statement before making any decision to invest. To obtain advice for your own situation, contact